I want to return to something we've seen before, namely heat capacity, but now within the context of considering constant pressure as well as constant volume processes. And so heat capacity is a path function, not a state function. Let me remind you the definition of heat capacity. It's the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree, and it's different when it's done at constant volume compared to, say, constant pressure. That's how we know it's a path-dependent function. So at constant volume, the energy added as heat, QV, is equal to delta U. And indeed, that's the definition we have of heat capacity. It is change in U with respect to change in temperature at constant volume. And if I write it in an infinitesimal way, that would be partial derivative of U with respect to T at constant volume. All right? So at constant volume, change in internal energy is heat. And that's an expression, then, of heat capacity. It's heat relative to change in temperature. At constant pressure, on the other hand, we will define a constant pressure heat capacity as the change in enthalpy with respect to the change in temperature, because at constant pressure, the heat is equal to the enthalpy. All right, so the amount of heat required to change the temperature by one degree, that would make the denominator one degree. That is the heat capacity. That's the definition. And so partial H, partial T at constant pressure. So with those definitions in mind, let me give you a chance to think about uh, what their relationships might be, and then we'll come back and look at them more closely. All right, so the question there was which of the two heat capacities, constant volume or constant pressure, would be larger. Let me take a specific example now that you've had a chance to think about the answer and hopefully answer correctly in order to get to here. Uh, let me do an ideal gas. And so recall for an ideal gas, definition of enthalpy is H equals U plus PV. <clears throat> and so for an ideal gas, PV is nRT. If I differentiate both sides with respect to temperature, I'll get dH dt is equal to du dt plus nR. Now, for an ideal gas, U and hence H depend only on temperature, not on pressure or volume. So I can write this more generally. This exact differential is also equal to the partial of H with respect to T. It's just a different way to write it. There are no other things H depends on, but I'll use the partial symbol. At constant pressure equals partial U, partial T at constant volume plus NR. That is, Cp plus, equals Cv plus NR. So the heat capacity at constant pressure is always going to be greater than the heat capacity at constant volume. How much greater for an ideal gas? By a factor of N, number of moles of the gas, times R. And I'll just remind you, if, if you haven't got a feel, is that a lot, a little? Well, remember that for a monatomic ideal gas, the molar heat capacity at constant volume was 3 halves R. So that would make the heat capacity, the molar constant pressure heat capacity, 5 halves R. That's, that's a 67% change, right? R is 67% of 3 halves R. Uh, and that's a non-trivial difference. So it takes considerably more heat added to raise the temperature by one degree when working at constant pressure compared to when working at constant volume. So, and, and of course the reason, by the way, is that you've got to expand the gas. You're doing PV work, and you've got to put the heat in to do that. Well, the reason this is interesting, this heat capacity at constant pressure is, it allows us to potentially determine enthalpy experimentally, or more accurately, perhaps, enthalpy changes. Remember, thermodynamics is usually about enthalpy changes, but we'll get to establishing zeros and being able to tabulate numbers in not too long. But let's talk about determining enthalpy then. The difference in enthalpy at two different temperatures is going to be determined by integrating Cp over the temperature range. We've already seen this for internal energy integrating Cv. 
Now I'm going to take CP equals partial H partial T. So I rewrite this as DH equals CP DT. So if I want to know H2 minus HT1, I integrate DH from T1 to T2. That's equivalent to integrating this from T1 to T2. And here that is, integral T1 to T2, CP DT. Now, it's important to mention this is only true if the phase of the system remains unchanged over that temperature range, T1 to T2. We actually did an example not so long ago of ice melting or water boiling. That's a phase change, and it takes additional heat, which is enthalpy at constant pressure, added to the system in order to accomplish a phase change. So at a phase change, the heat capacity becomes infinite. Right? You are uh, adding heat into the system without changing the temperature. So the denominator, if you like, is, is zero, and that's why it goes to infinity. Uh, but you can measure heat capacity over the range of a pure phase, and then you'll eventually get to a phase change, and you'll need to measure that differently. But it, it can be measured. And so uh, if you like, a way to think about crossing a phase boundary would be if I want to know the enthalpy at a temperature T, and I'll start from zero. I'll have to assign some number to the enthalpy at absolute zero. We can talk about how you might do that. But anyway, there is some number associated with that. How would I do it? Well, I'll integrate from zero up to the melting point. I'm going to assume that at absolute zero, it's probably a solid. Uh, I'll integrate the solid's heat capacity up to the melting point. Then I will add the enthalpy of fusion. And then I'll integrate from that temperature, which is still the same temperature, the temperature of fusion, up to the temperature of interest, T, the heat capacity of the liquid. And it'll have a distinct heat capacity uh, from that of the solid. <coughs> so just what I said, solid from T equals 0 to T fusion. Enthalpy of fusion, which is the enthalpy of the liquid minus the enthalpy of the solid at that fusion temperature, and then the liquid. So let me show you what that looks like in practice, show you some experimental data. Benzene. So benzene, an aromatic organic molecule uh, found in oil. And it has a melting point of 278.7 Kelvin and a boiling point of 353.2 Kelvin. And if you measure its heat capacity temperature by temperature, and what does that mean to measure the heat capacity? It, it's pretty simple. You put a thermometer in the substance. You add heat in some controlled fashion that you can quantify how much heat you're putting in, and you measure how much you put in to get it to go up one degree. Maybe that's how many liters of methane did you burn in a Bunsen burner. Maybe it's how many calories of sugar did you expend while you were turning a crank. That would be a hard experiment to do. But in any case, you can measure it. And you can measure it degree by degree. So it does vary. This is temperature on this axis. This is the constant pressure heat capacity. And what you see is at absolute zero, it takes hardly any. And then as you rise in temperature, it's taking increasingly more energy added in order to raise the temperature. And that's because that energy is flowing into more accessible modes. Rotations, vibrations are beginning to pick up some of the energy, and they're not being put into translation, which increases temperature. That's really a gas explanation, and we're we're sitting in a solid region, but it's the same conceptual ideas. In any case, we rise, we rise, we rise. We finally hit the melting point. Here, the heat capacity would go infinite. We can't measure it directly. We would have to do a, a measurement where we just watch until all the solid melts and becomes liquid, and we know how much heat we put in. So that's the heat of fusion. And now we go measure the liquid, and then it boils, and we measure the gas. And this would be key experimental data. The enthalpy itself, then, because these are enthalpy changes with respect to temperature, to get the enthalpy is the integral under these curves. And so that's what's shown over here. As I raise the temperature, what is the additional enthalpy, that is the additional heat that's been absorbed into the system that's there, I can extract it maybe to do interesting things, as a function of temperature. So I don't have anything in there when I start. And I'm pouring it in, pouring it in. It's going up, up, up as a solid. And then the temperature doesn't change anymore, but I pour in a whole bunch to make it change phase. I pour in more to increase the enthalpy of the liquid. Stops 
absorbing, but it does start turning into a gas. And then finally, I got all this enthalpy in the gas. So I'm integrating, that is for T, above the vaporization temperature. The enthalpy relative to zero would be integral over the solid plus the, the heat of fusion, integral over the liquid plus the heat of vaporization, and then finally integral over the temperature to whatever temperature I'm at in the vapor. All right, hopefully that made clear. The, the experiments are relatively simple, and you would have a way to record the enthalpy change relative to absolute zero. It might not be the most convenient place to anchor your scale to. It might be hard to do a measurement at absolute zero. So we're going to talk next about thermochemistry in general, using these enthalpies in order to understand reaction energetics, make predictions, not unlike what I illustrated for the thermite reaction in week one. But we'll explore it a little more generally here and standardize it some.